Okay, now it's chapter 18. The narrative continued by the doctor, the jolly boat's last trip. All right, last we left the doctor, the captain, the squire, their men uh, who are currently, we know them to be named Hunter, uh, Joyce, and Red Ruth. Okay, and then one more that just joined them, Abraham Gray. Um, some of them uh, are at the stockade, and that is Joyce, Hunter, Joyce and Hunter are at the stockade. The rest are in a boat called the Jolly Boat, a small-ish rowboat that fits just these guys and a bunch of the gear that they're trying to carry. It's kind of overloaded, okay? And they have left the boat, and they're rowing to the shore. And that's where we are right now at the beginning of this. Make sure that you have your notes handy so you can make notes as you go that you make sure that you've got um, highlighters or a pencil or something so you can mark the text as you go to give yourself a, a, you know, kind of a shortcut to make sure you know what you're coming back to to write about. I modeled last time that even though you've read a chapter, sometimes it's a really good idea to go back and kind of reread or scan it and make sense out of it after you've read through it one time. Never be afraid to go back into it again. I know that sometimes we don't feel like we've got time to do that, but the second time through is always a little easier than the first. So it isn't the same as reading it 100% twice and over and over again. And then if you still have questions and you still don't know what it means, and this doesn't help you, look at your summary. Look at uh, the summaries that were provided. Look um, online for, for an explanation. Listen to an audio. Try to get as much meaning out of, of it as you can and improve your reading skills by improve your listening skills um, uh, and get more of that vocabulary embedded. Um, that's why we read hard things is so that we uh, have better vocabularies and we get better at reading the harder things. It stretches us and pushes us to be better readers. Okay, sometimes it seems almost impossible to understand things that are unfamiliar to us, but the more that we work at it, the better that we get. All right, enough of that. Let's get to work. Okay. Narrative continued by the doctor, the Jolly Boat's last trip. This fifth trip was quite different from any of the others. In the first place, the little gallipot of a boat that we were in was gravely overloaded. Five grown men, and three of them, Trelawney, Red Ruth, and the captain, over six feet high, was already more than she was meant to carry. Add to that the powder, pork, and bread bags. The gunwale was lipping astern. Several times we shipped a little water, and my breeches and the tails of my coat were all soaking wet before we had gone a hundred yards. So the boat's taken on water because it's overloaded. The captain made us trim the boat, and we got her to lie a little more evenly. All the same, we were afraid to breathe. Okay. In the second place, the ebb was now making a strong rippling current running westward through the basin and then southward to the seaward down the straits by which we had entered in the morning. So the ebb tide is the, is the tide that moves away from the shore. And so that's kind of pulling at the boat differently than it did before when they were making their trips. Even the ripples were a danger to our overloaded craft, but the worst of it was that we were swept out of our true course and away from our proper landing place behind the point. If we let the current have its way, we should come ashore beside the gigs where the pirates might appear at any moment. So they're being kind of pushed to go towards where the pirates are instead of where uh, their landing place is to get to the stockade. Sorry about all the bouncing. My dog is not comfortable and he keeps changing his place behind the computer. All right, so back to the reading. Uh, I cannot keep her head for the to the uh, her head for the stockade, sir," said I to the captain, because the the um, the doctor is on the rudder. He's the one who's trying to keep it um, going the right direction, and that's why he's wet because he said that it was kind of overflowing at the stern as the boat's sitting really low in the water. Okay, uh, I was steering while he and Red Ruth, two freshmen, were at the oars. The tide keeps washing her down. Could you pull a little stronger? Not without swamping the boat, said he. You must bear up, sir, if you please. Bear up until you see you're gaining. I tried and found by experiment that the tide kept sweeping us westward until I had laid her head due east or just about right angles to the way we, could, we ought to go. So he's having to almost like turn the boat like they're like, like coming at everything sideways, the way that everything's getting pushed, okay? Um, we'll never get ashore at this rate, said I. If it's the only course that we can lie, sir, we must even lie it, Turn the captain, returned the captain. 
You must keep upstream. You see, sir, he went on, if once we drop to leeward of the landing place, it's hard to say where we should get ashore, besides the chance of being boarded by the gigs. Whereas the way we go, the way we go, the current must, must slacken, and then we can dodge back along the shore. The current's less already, sir, said the man Gray, who was sitting at the fore sheets. You can ease her, ease her off a bit. Thank you, my man, said I, quite as if nothing had happened, for we had all quietly made up our minds to treat him like one of ourselves. I remember, Abraham Gray, a minute ago, was one of the suspected pirates. Uh, but at the very last, he decided to jump in and join them. And he gives them some advice. He's like, oh, look, the current's changing. You're going to be fine. And he was right. And they're all like, thank you. He's just part of the team now. Uh, suddenly the captain spoke up again and I thought his voice was a little changed. The gun, said he. I have thought of that, said I, for I made sure he was thinking of a bombardment of the fort. They could never get the gun ashore and if they did, they could never haul it through the woods. Look astern, doctor, replied the captain. We had entirely forgotten the long nine and there, to our horror, were the five rogues busy about her getting off her jacket, as they called the stout tarpaulin cover under which she, she sailed. Not only that, but it flashed into my mind at the same moment that the round shot and the powder for the gun had been left behind, and a stroke with an ax would put it all into the possession of the evil ones abroad. Okay, so they're talking about the cannon that is on the ship. They call it the Long Nine. There's only one, and uh, it was under a tarp. That's what a tarpaulin. Tarpaulin is, is what tarp is short for. And it's just a covering to keep it from getting wet because remember when the powder and um, all the fixings of the gun get wet, then it doesn't work so well. And it's a boat, so things get wet. So um, the guys that are on the ship right now have pulled up the tarp and they're getting the cannon ready. What are they gonna shoot at, do you suppose, right? And they had forgotten, they could have just thrown all of that into the ocean, but they left it there for the pirates to use, unfortunately. Um, Israel was fit Flint's gunner, said Gray hoarsely. Remember, Israel Hands is one of the guys left back on the boat. Israel Hands was the gunner, the guy who managed the cannon, back on the pirate Flint's ship. At any risk, we put the boat's head direct for the landing place. By this time, we had, not, we had got so far out of the run of the current that we kept steerage way even at our steerage way, even at our necessarily gentle rate of rowing, and I could keep her steady for the goal. But the worst of it was that with the course I now held, we turned our broadside instead of our stern to the Hispaniola and offered a target like a barn door. So in order to get where they're going, they're almost turned like broadside. So that instead of aiming at the back of them, going away from them, they're aiming the cannon basically at the side of the boat. They have a bigger target. I could hear as well as see that brandy-faced rascal, Israel Hands, plumping down a round shot, a cannonball, on the deck. Who's the best shot? asked the captain. Mr. Trelawney, out and away, said I. Mr. Trelawney, will you please pick me off one of these men, sir? Hands, if possible, said the captain. Trelawney was as cool as steel. He looked to the priming of his gun. Now, cried the captain, easy with that gun, sir, or you'll swamp the boat. All hands stand by to trimmer when he aims. The squire raised his gun, the rowing ceased, and we leaned over to the other side to keep the balance, and all was so nicely contrived that we did not ship a drop. They had the gun by this time slewed round upon the swivel, and Hans, who was at the muzzle with the rammer, was in consequence the most exposed. However, we had no luck, for just as Trelawney fired, down he stooped. The ball whistled over him, and it was one of the other four who fell. Okay, so the scene is this. They're in this little boat. Trelawney is the best shot. He has to stand up, prime his gun, and so that's a black powder gun, so he has to like pack it and then you know get it you know ready to go and then stand up and shoot and it's gonna have a lot of kickback, right? And so they have in this overloaded sinking basically boat, they have to like lean to keep it from um ducking under the water, right? So they do that and he he it's a really good shot, but just as he's shooting, the guy he's aiming for ducks down to do something and it hits a different guy. So they don't hit the guy who's the, the cannon expert. Okay. The cry he gave was echoed not only by his companions on board, but by a great number of voices from the shore. And looking in that direction, I saw the other pirates trooping out from among the trees and tumbling into their places in the boats. Here come the gigs, sir, said I. 
Give way then, cried the captain. We mustn't mind if we swamp her now. If we can't get ashore, all's up. Only one of the gigs is being manned, sir, I added. The crew of the other most likely going round by shore to cut us off. They'll have a hot run, sir, replied the, returned the captain. Jack ashore. You know, it's not them I mind, it's the round shot. Carpet bowls, my lady maid couldn't miss. Uh, my lady's maid couldn't miss. Tell us, squire, when you see the match, and we'll hold water. Okay, that's really hard, so let's back her up a little bit. Um, so uh, the doctor's like, the gigs, the other rowboats, the, the pirates are, are getting them, they're coming after us. And he's like, then just get shore any way you can. Don't worry about how we're doing it, just get there. Um, it doesn't matter even if we swamp the boat. Uh, if we don't get shore, we're just not, we're not going to make it, period. And then only one of the boats is coming at them. So the other half of the pirates, instead of taking the boat after them, is running along the shore to cut them off, right? And he's like, you know what? We can't worry about that now. What we have to worry about is the round shot, the cannon. The cannon is our biggest worry right now. We're such a huge target that anybody could hit us. And, and, he, and he says, so tell us when you see the match, because with a cannon, you have to light a big, like kind of a long match and stand back and light the fuse for it to go boom, right? And so he, he's got uh, the squire watching and saying, when you see the match, we'll hold water. So um, they're gonna like, if, if you're aiming for a moving boat, you're aiming for where they're going to be. So he's like, as soon as you see the match, say something and we'll stop. We'll like make, push the push back, like not, not keep our, our course and hopefully get missed, okay? So that's what they're gonna try to do. In the meanwhile, we had been making headway at a good pace for a boat so overloaded, and we had shipped but little water in the process. We were now close in, 30 or 40 strokes, and we should beach her, for the ebb had already disclosed a narrow belt of sand below the clustering trees. The gig was no longer to be feared. The little point had already concealed it from our eyes. The ebb tide, which was so cruelly had so cruelly delayed us, was now making reparation and delaying our assailants. The one source of danger was the gun, the cannon. Okay. If I durst, said the captain, I'd stop and pick off another man. But it was plain that they meant nothing should delay their shot. They had never so much as looked at their fallen comrade, though he was not dead, and I could see him trying to crawl away. That's the guy up on the boat that the squire had shot. He's not dead, he's crawling around, and they're not even paying attention. They're just loading the cannon because they're going to shoot at them, okay? Ready, cried the squire, and that means the match was going. Hold, cried the captain, quick as an echo. And he and Red Ruth backed with a great heave that sent her stern bodily underwater. The report fell in at the same instant of time. This was the first that Jim had heard, the sound of the squire's shot not having reached him. Where the ball passed, not one of us precisely knew, but I fancy it must have been over our heads and that the wind of it may have contributed to our disaster. At any rate, the boat sank by the stern, quite gently, in three feet of water leaving the captain and myself facing each other on our feet. The other three took complete headers and came up again drenched and bubbling. Okay, so let me describe the scene. You got this boat, it's loaded with gear and five guys, right? They are really low in the water and they're rowing to get to shore. They know that they're getting shot at by a cannon, it's coming at them, and so that they don't get hit by it, they basically put the brakes on by rowing the opposite direction really fast. And unfortunately, it sent the bottom of the boat or like the back of the boat down so they got swamped by water and it just slowly, gently sank in three feet of water. And the captain and Dr. Livesey are facing each other because uh, the captain's at the front telling everybody what to do and Dr. Livesey's at the back steering the boat and the other guys who were in the middle can take complete headers, which is interesting that that was actually a term back then too, but a header is when you fall head first into something and they fell head first into the water, okay? So they basically get dumped, okay? But it's only three feet of water. So far, there was no great harm. No lives were lost and we could wade ashore in safety, but there were all our stores at the bottom, all the goods that they had, they had packed, right? And to make things worse, only two guns out of the five remained in a state for service. If those kind of guns got wet, they weren't useful for a while, okay? Mine, I had snatched from my knees and held over my head by a sort of instinct. As for the captain, he'd carried his over his shoulder by a bandolier and like a wise man, locked uppermost, lock uppermost. So he had it on his back with the part that can't get wet up high, okay? And he's a tall guy, so it worked out. Um, 
the other three had gone down with their boat, with the boat. To add to our concern, we heard voices already drawing near us in the woods along shore. And we had not only the danger of being cut off from the stockade and our half crippled state, but the fear before us whether if Hunter and Joyce were attacked by half a dozen, they would have the sense and conduct to stand firm. Hunter was steady, that we knew. Joyce was a doubtful case, a pleasant, polite man for a valet or valet, however you wanna say it, and to brush one's clothes, but not entirely fitted for a man of war. So let me explain what that is. A valet or valet is a um, kind of like a butler, only instead of like being, uh, butlers, they're, they're literally the people who open bottles at dinner time and they're like uh, kind of the, how, the head house guy. Uh, a valet is the guy who helps his uh, noble uh, boss get dressed in the morning, you know, pick out his clothes. He's like his manservant, and that's who Joyce is. And so like, well, hopefully Joyce would be okay if they get attacked. He's not exactly a warrior. Hmm. So they're a little bit worried. Uh, with all this in our minds, we waded ashore as fast as we could, leaving behind us the poor jolly boat and a good half of all our powder and provisions. Remember, when they say powder, they mean gunpowder. So that means they don't have a lot of ammunition, and they also don't have a lot of provisions, which means enough food. And they may be stuck here a while, so that could be a problem. And they have to leave it sunk with the boat. But they know they're about to get run up on by a bunch of pirates, so they don't have a lot of time. And that concludes this chapter. So another action-packed one. Uh, make sure that you write down at least what three of the characters did. And I will suggest to you, of course, one should be the doctor because he's the narrator and he's telling what he did quite clearly. You've got Squire Trelawney who takes a shot at folks and that might be interesting to write about. And you certainly have the captain who's telling everybody what to do. But you may choose to record what like Israel Hands, the gunner does because he's also kind of important in this. And he comes back later. Uh, if you look look at the uh, table of contents, there's a whole chapter titled Israel Hands. So it might be important to remember who he is. Okay, that's a lot of information for this one. Let's come back now uh, uh, and read chapter 18 next, but bye for now.